Ah, oh, look, it's only 924. So if you're facing this, I'll show you guys the command. NTP, NTP, date. And there's lots of NTP servers around the country. We have one in the building, I believe. But this one, so ntp.ubuntu.com, is somewhere in the world, and it will tell our computer what time it is. So if we do date, you can see that it's not the right date. Type in the root password, it's gonna go off and work, and hopefully the clock will get set to the right time. And if we type date again, it's now 11. And ignore this clock up here, which is completely wonky. So this is the command right here. If you run this command, it goes off and asks, there's a server on campus called Wilmo. It's a strange name for a time server, but there's lots of them all over the country, shit all over the world, pretty much every continent. If you have a weird time, date time settings, that was up here under date time settings. If you, you might have your computer set to be somewhere else in the world. If it's in California, that's gonna throw another three hour offset in there for you. Do we need to be in class 13 to do that? Nope, you can be anywhere. I just happen to be there. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and log into IRC. The password is, the, if you're on the oh, virtual machine, it's the password up on the whiteboard. And if we were on a regular internet, we're kind of behind a firewall that won't let us do this, but you could say trace route is a Unix command that would tell you how far away something is. So we could say ntp ubuntu.com and trace route isn't installed, nor will it work inside of CCOM. There's tools inside of Unix to let you check out the network, see how far away computers are from you. So if you really wanted to have a really good sense of time, you'd either hook a GPS right up to the computer, or you would uh, have an NTP server close by, and you would know that it was network latency-wise pretty close, so that it wasn't a long delay between here and there. Because if we do a ping NTP Ubuntu.com, You'll see it's, if we look on the right here, it's 81 milliseconds to go to that computer and back, which in the world of computers is a very long time. So if you guys haven't used ping before, it's a fun command. You can ping lots of computers around the world. You can ping computers in Antarctica if you want to, if you know their name. All right, you guys ready to dig into some more Python? Do one more lecture before we start actually processing data and doing some real fun stuff. So let's go ahead and type clear if you have too much junk on your screen don't want to see it. I Python PyLab. And last time we did some for loops, so you might remember that. And I'm gonna also point you at, on the research tools page, there are now 12 videos that go through all sorts of stuff. I've got a video on if modules, command line stuff we'll be talking about today. I did one this morning on while loops. And those, you can just hit pause. You'll be able to see me go through everything. So please make sure you watch those videos and keep up. But let's go ahead and dig into the if command. Because up till now, we've been able to loop over things, but we haven't been able to test or try out anything. So the way if works is you start off with the word if, surprise, surprise, uh, some space. Then you're gonna have some sort of test right here. Then you're gonna have a colon and then you're gonna remember that with Python, when you indent, that controls blocks within loops and things like that. So you're gonna indent four spaces, and then you can have something that you wanna do, say like print high. Then we can do the else condition. So if this is false, it'll do this one down here. And was false. It's kinda of nice to be able to, to test things and do different code based on what you see in that. So let's go ahead and try some. And I've tried a little bit different strategy this time on the class notes. I haven't written a lot of text around the code because last time we got totally turned around where in the class notes we were. And when I looked at people's screens, I couldn't figure out where you guys were either. So I'm gonna keep it shorter this time. So if you download the org file and follow along, it's gonna be a lot simpler. So let's go ahead and try some ifs inside of our IPython. But we'll start off with looking at true and false really quick. So there's true and there's false are our two possible cases for Booleans or the, the, sort of the truth variable type. And if you say type true or type false, they'll um, come back as bool. 
And let's try out some quick tests. We can say, does one equal one? True. Does one not equal one? No. They're the same. And you can do things like true or false. It comes back true. If it's true and false, you come back with false. So we can teach a whole semester course on true and false. Yes, so the single equal sign is uh, an assignment. So A equals true. And then if we say who, percent who, or whose, we have a variable set with that. And if you do equals equals, that's testing our two things the same. So if we have two strings, well, the double equals does the test case to see if they're the same. You can also do greater than or equal to, so you can do four less than five or greater than five. And then there's, you can also do an equal in there too. So let's use those in a quick if test and we'll be really boring. So if true, print yes. Remember you gotta hit return a couple times to get out of that block to get down to actually run the command and get the return yes. So we'll do this, the same thing, but we'll give it a false to see if we run what comes after it. So print yes. And anyone want to take a wild guess what we get back? Nothing. Nothing, yes. There's no yes. All right, so let's try an if else. If true, print yes. Now remember you got to back up all the way to the left there. So else, colon, print no. So then you can hit the up arrow and it's going to look a lot weird when you hit the up arrow in IPython with a block because you don't have the dots that are showing you the indentation it's doing. And you can't just hit the up arrow to get in around this. You got to hit go left and more left and then replace that with false. So no. So that's your basic if test. So when you're going through data, you're looping through it, you can check for things. You can say, a classic one is if you're looking through like GPS strings in NEMA and you're looking for something that's called like a GGA NEMA string for your GPS position, you can say is GGA in uh, AI GGA and then a whole bunch of data. We'll just type some random numbers. Um, up here, why are there no dots here? Yeah. So these, I hit the up arrow and then I start oh. typing over the old what one. Yeah, that's why, so I'll, I'll show you again. To take a look at the screen, if we scroll up, when you get to an old answer that's multiple lines, you don't have the dots in there, so it looks a lot different. Okay. It can get pretty confusing. Okay. So is GGA, the string here, inside of this big blob here, and in fact it's right there. I'm just, it's, with our statement it says, if true, print yes. We're not saying if, something is true. We're just saying if it's true. Yep. If you want to see an example? True. It's an expression. So we can say if uh, one, let's do uh, pick something. So three in, and we'll make a list. So two, three, you know, if we skip three there, print found. So that failed. So it's some expression, and this can be either a, like a math expression testing or two numbers the same or greater than, less than or anything that returns true or false. So three in, two, three, four, five, returns true because the number three is sitting inside of there. And if we take three out, then it's false. There's no three in that set, that list. Yeah, with that, I understand that. It's just mm -hmm. when you say if true. Yep. So yes. So it automatically says true is true? Yes. Okay. So if you look up here, you can put anything you want in here and it would evaluate to false would be the same thing. Oh. And so you'll see sometimes see people, oh. like try, I was trying to make it a little more obvious and instead I made it a little more confusing. You know, so you can do something like if one equals two, print they match and it won't match. And if we said if, if one equals one, which is print, they match, and they should match this time. So they match. If there's more than one if, like you have a lot of ifs in a row. Oh, if you want multiple things to test together, like an and or an or kind of thing, or. Mm -hmm. 
So you can chain them together. Let's do, uh, so you can do if false else elif, and then you can test something else. One equals two print case two elif, you know, two equals two print case three else print default at the end. So that's, you can chain together ifs and else ifs like that. Yep. And in fact, if you, from some other programming background where there was a case statement, so some languages have a case. Python doesn't have a case. There's other ways to do it, and one of the ways is to chain a bunch of ifs together until you find the, the one that you want to hit. What's that? Pass means do nothing. So pass is like a blank st statement. We could just say print case one. So if we wanted, and we're from the right spot, so I can then say ls, we could say run c13. We can run that little program, and it went through and tried this one. This was false, so it went to the next one. That was false. This one, two was equal to two, print case three. So we can build up stuff like that. Mostly I'm just trying to show this to you to give you a sense so that when we get into actually working with data, you'll start seeing these things again. You can come back, uh, take a look at them again, and get comfortable with them as we actually process some data. All right, any questions before we uh, move on to... At this point, I'm going to assume that you're comfortable with creating files in Emacs. All right, so let's go ahead and try the while statement. And I'm going to tell you right up front that 99 times out of 100, when you want to create a while statement, you actually mean to be creating a for statement, a for loop. A lot of times, people learn while it seems very comfortable and familiar, whereas for seems a little strange to a lot of people. But the for loop is easier to follow and understand in the long run. So I'm going to show you while, but only in a few cases do you actually want to use while. And it's hard for me to come up with many because I tend to not use it very much. But we'll go ahead and create a little while loop. So we'll say count equals zero. And we're going to make a loop that counts through until it gets to a certain number. So we can say while count is less than 10. So this is just like in the if statement. We have some expression in here. As long as this is true, our loop keeps going. And you can do bad things here. You can set this to always be true, and your program is never going to finish. And if you're in IPython, you're going to sit there and just stare at this thing and wonder what it's doing. So once you hit enter in here, you're inside. We can say print count. So here we're just going to do a little count colon and then the number that we've got. And in this case, it's very important that you do this next line, or you're going to be pressing control C to kill your program. You'll say count equals count plus one. Let's go ahead and run that. And you should see a whole bunch of numbers go scrolling by your screen. You can also type it into over here in uh, Emacs, create a file and run it. So I'll go ahead and do that. We'll just open up uh, c132.py for me. So I've created a file with just a slightly different name. And we'll just copy that in there, edit, paste. And we'll get rid of all these uh, formatting things. So I can now say ls, and you'll see that I've got this c13 underscore 2. And we can say run c13 underscore 2. Now that's, it's fine, it works. But probably what you'd rather do would be for count in range 10, print count. So compare those two. Here we had four actual lines, and we kind of wanted to have a space, a blank line there to separate our setup with our actual thing, to a for loop with just two lines over here, a lot simpler. Typically, while loops are tough. And in the video, uh, I think video 11, I go through with while loops, uh, maybe it's 12. You'll see I walk you through doing some complicated things with while loops that are actually a lot easier to do with just range and creating a list of numbers. The one time where you do want to use while loops is if you're making something that's going to run forever. Like if you're on a ship and you're writing a little program that's going to watch say like the GPS and keep doing something for your entire cruise, you don't want it to quit. 
So every time through the loop, you would use a while loop. You'd just say while true, and it would always go. And you could kill it by either closing the window that it was in or hitting control C and uh, killing that program. So that's the basic while loop. If you never learn while loop, you're not missing out on too much. Uh, well, I say to save this is the Emacs thing, but for some reason we're not missing it. Some quick things to try. You can do, let's see if I, if you do a PWD, print working directory, it, it'll tell you where you are in your IPython shell. And if you do, if you're in, say, an Emacs buffer and you do control X, control F, at the bottom, it's going to tell you which directory you're, you're in right now. Right. And you'll probably see that either, you know, you might be sitting in class right. over on the Emacs side, or you might be in the wrong directory over on the IPython side. So I saved it in class, not in class 13. Yep. And if you, if you want to, control X, W is write to some other location. So another Emacs command, or Emacs command for the day, CX. W is write the current buffer to some other file. Write to a different... So if you're working on a file, and a classic thing that you maybe want to do is you're working on something for a long time and you want to save multiple versions, you can write it to the next version if you're just doing version control by hand. And hopefully, under here, that's the same as doing save as up on the menu. So it's a convenient way of just getting something into the right directory without really taking care of cleaning up after yourself, but it works. I'm going to go ahead and open up a new file, 13 underscore 3.py, to give myself some blank workspace here. And we're going to talk a little bit about functions. And this is a way that you can save, you can think of it as sort of a macro, or if you want to repeat something, a task that you're doing, again and again down the road, it can capture all sorts of, of things inside of a function, and you can call that function anytime you want and repeat that set of operations. So it's a way to almost uh, kind of a force multiplier that makes you more powerful. The more functions you have that you understand, you can call those out and they can do things for you down the road. Let's make some functions and play with them a little bit. And we'll start off with a very powerful function hello world, and print hello world. So when we do a function, the def is the saying that we're defining a function. Right after it comes the name of the function, so in our case, hello world. And then there's something called arguments, and I'm going to put a comment here for those of you who, even if you know English, you might not know this, arguments. And I'm going to do meta dollar and make sure I spell it correctly. So, yep, spelled correctly. If you're having trouble with this, you can look up that word and get a sense of it. This is the parameters or things that you will give the function to work with. In our case, we're not going to give hello world anything. It knows everything it needs to do it. We can then type run C13.3 or whatever you called your, your program. When it runs this Python script, nothing happens. It's not very exciting. What it did is it defined the function, but didn't actually use it. So nothing called it, so we're not going to see anything. Let's call our function like we've been doing with a number of other functions that come with it. So like if we did, um, let's see, we'll just do import math. And if you do like math.sign of 3.1415, this is calling a function, which is really close to zero. If we define a function here and then we call it without the def but with uh, two parentheses after it, then it should, if we save this down here, see the two stuff means I haven't saved, so control X, control S. And now let's say run, run C13.3. So go ahead and give it a try to run it and you should see hello world where it's calling our function. I think I misnamed it. Do an ls, okay, in the PWD, so you're in class 13. So go into your window on the left, the Emacs window, and do a save as, so control x, w, control w. Control x, control w. Yep, now type 13 slash 
slash, and then whatever you want to call it. So 13 underscore, you could do like C 13 underscore, and then you know two or three or whatever number you want to be on. So you can, if you copy me, it'd be three. And then save that. Dot py, press enter, and now go back to your IPython and try to run it from there. For instance, some MATLAB is the semicolon. Semicolons, yeah, they're not really used very much in Python. You're you're thinking of C, probably, if right? If you don't want to watch the output, in this case, no? if you want to run it, run without and you could redirect it to DevNel or something fancy in in Unix. But it's that program is designed to make output, so you, you can send the output someplace else. But that's uh, more advanced than we're going to get to for a long time. So. Why did it print uh, "Hello World" uh, the second time you did it after importing the math? After importing the math, the importing the math was a distractor. Yeah. So I was trying to confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I added the "Hello World" in the two parentheses on the in the Emacs window. So I added this command here. Uh, I didn't have that before. Oh, uh, that's all it was. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we call the function. Don't forget to save. See those two stars? That means you haven't saved. So that's a function. No more uh, it's for it's spelled M A T H without the C. So that's like light the match. He's gonna set the set the computer on fire. So just get rid of the C there. There you go. So now you hit enter, and now you can do math dot sign. So let's create functions. Aren't very useful unless you can give them some information. Where did you import the math? Math comes with Python. Uh, if you look up. On the Python documentation, there's uh, the standard library, and there's several hundred modules like that. There's one called sys, one called os for operating system. There's one for command line arguments. There's a whole ton of them, and you get them for free with Python. You just have to know that they're there. So you have to tell it to work. Yeah, so they're not available unless you do the import. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to comment out our hello world, and let's make a function that takes something. In terms of arguments, I have a function that I end up writing way too often that's a nice one. So if we do import math, because we're going to use some math here, we're going to find a distance. If you remember Pythagorean's theorem, it's the if you've got your two points and you've got a triangle, if this is x1, y1, and this is x2, y2, your distance equals the square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. Hopefully you all remember your trig, right? This, if you have to type that out every time you want to do the distance, you're going to go nuts. That's a lot of little symbols to type. So let's create ourselves a distance function. So we're going to have to do if we do um, math.square root will be our square root function that we'll have. We'll be using that and then we'll pass in our x1, y1 for our first point and x2, y2 for the second point. So x1, y1 is our first point and x2, y2 is our second point. And you have the colon just like before. And when you put those in those parentheses, you can now use those variables inside of the function. And we can say d equals the square root, except for I need to have math on there, math.square root. So that's our outer square root. And the first part is going to be x1 minus x2. And we can just write it all out longhand. This is really unfun, which is why you write in a function once and then just use it from later there on out. So y1 minus y2 times... Is caret does not work. There's two stars. We'll do the power. I was going to avoid that for the first pass through and then I'll show you the, the simpler way of doing it. So we could say y1 minus y2. So that calculates the distance and then there's this new keyword called return, D. So return passes back a value from that function. So if we do import C 13 underscore three. Now here's something where you could have gotten in trouble very easily. Your file name, if it doesn't start with a letter, 
And if you have anything other than numbers and underscores and letters in your file name, Python can't import it. So this is the, the booby trap. If you had a, a dash rather than like that as your file name, Python doesn't know how to import that. So it has a very strong sense of file naming. And if you put spaces in your file name, you are in really big trouble. You're going to have no fun with spaces. So if we import our library like that, you're going to see if you type typo at all, probably an, an error. And hopefully it'll point you at your typo. And you can say C13.3 period and press tab. Invalid syntax. You missed the colon. If you look right here on the right, see how it's pointing right there on your def distance? There should be a colon there. If you look up at mine, def distance right after the Y2 in the parentheses is a colon. So if you have this distance, now we can give it two points. We can say like 1, 1 and 11, 13, pick your favorite numbers. Press enter. And it's now told you the distance between those two points. So rather than having to go type all of this annoying stuff every time you want a distance, you can just ask for the distance. This way, if you're working on a set of math equations that you're building up, say, for a thesis project, you can implement all of those math equations once, and then you can just use them elsewhere in your program. Print goes to standard out. It goes to the console. Return is going back to a variable so you can assign it. Once something has been printed, the program doesn't know about it anymore. It's gone. It's for you. So printing is for you, the human, and the return is for the, the program. So if you wanted to do like this instead, print like that. So we'll, we'll have to reload. So once you load a module, I'll get to your other two questions in a second here. Reload brings a module back in if you've changed it. Otherwise, it's not going to notice a change. So we'll say C13.3. And then if I run my distance, it's printed. But notice here, it said out. And here, it said nothing. This, this is only, you can copy and paste this, but that's the only place it exists now. If I uh, now run D, just D, I don't have this variable. We had, yeah, D, is, no. D doesn't exist. And D only exists in this space, inside of that function. So it's local to that function. You save that. So do um, go back to your IPython and type reload and then C13 underscore 3. Press enter. Um, so if you look up here, you've added a space. Mm -hmm. So control A. See how you have a space between the left hand side and that? Delete that space and also delete the space right there. Yep, you've actually indented one character yeah. and told it that you're creating a new block that's underneath that function hello world, and it got very confused. So, so try your reload again. Uh, then you, you maybe you hadn't quite saved in time, and then you oh, okay. did the yeah. import. Ben? Is there any difference between running import again or using reload? If you do import again, nothing will change. It won't actually go to the disk and get your new code. You have to reload. So unfortunately, it's a little confusing. Invalid syntax. OK. Do a reload in here. So click in there and do a reload of your module. And now you can do C13, tab, 3, period, and then tab. Enter means I'm running the thing. Tab says try to figure out what, sh what goes next. Int object not callable. You're having fun. Um, do a reload of your function, of your uh, module. So C reload C13 invalid syntax. But it imported it. I would do delete, D-E-L, and your C underscore 13 underscore 3. Try importing it now, and should then it, there? it should be gone. OK. So now do import that, and now try C underscore 13. Int is not callable. Oh boy, I am totally not sure what's going on there with your code. Why it's having trouble? I would say create a new file and type it again, and there might be something that we missed. Either you you might have a typo, like a bug of some sort in there, or you um, pick something that was. So I'm guessing you might have a typographic error somewhere in your code. 
um, with a ones or twos somewhere. So welcome to the land of bugs and uh, trouble with software. It's not always easy. It takes time to get to know how to find some of those problems. Let's go on and talk about another kind of container. But first, we'll save. I'll show you taking that distance. If you want to save into a variable, you can say like my distance equals, and if we do a whose, we now have my distance saved. I now have a print, and <laughs> I need to reload my C13. So now if I do this, my distance equals. So now if I do a whose, my distance is saved. Yeah, so with that, by having a print and not a return, that information got lost, so I was missing it. So we're going to talk about another kind of container that we'll be using throughout the class. And we've actually used them already without making any new ones. And I'm going to show you them. And we're going to keep coming back and looking at them over time and build a couple. And you'll, it's one of those things where I want you guys to learn, not necessarily by trying to figure it out, but just see a few examples. And hopefully, over the next few weeks, you'll get a sense of what these things are. And they're called a class. And a class is, so we have functions that do, they're like procedural, do this kind of stuff. It's like you're, you open up the instruction manual for like you, if you buy a new washer and dryer for your house. When it comes to a class, it has the data that goes with it. So it also has like your laundry and the washer and dryer together. And then how do they work together? So it's, a, it's instructions and data that go together. And it can be like you could have a class that represents your ship. Say you're working on a ship that knows about the ship and you can tell the ship where to go. And then the ship will go off and take care of itself to go someplace. Uh, or if you're working at Seacom, you ask Ben to go someplace. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of fancy things with classes, but I'm just going to show you the basics real quick. So it starts off with the word class. There's a whole thing called inheritance that we're, when someone says inheritance to you, cover your ears for this class and say, I don't need to know about that. It's very, it's lots of fancy, powerful stuff, but we don't need it. So you'll just put object in here saying that this thing is of type object. And you'll have a name that goes right in here. So your name of your class. So it could be, in this case, would write ship. So class ship. And you're going to find that there's some conventions in Python. When you typically see a first case capital letter, so right here, if this is capital, that's going to tend to be a class. If it's a function, that'll be lowercase. So these, these conventions aren't required. They're just there to help you out a little bit. So you can have a ship, and then that ship can have some data with it and some things that it can do. There's a couple ones to know about. The first one is the most important. So Remember how I said don't worry about all those underscores that we had with various things? We now have to start worrying about a little bit about the underscores. So init self, and then we could say max speed. The only place there has to be a space is right here. So this would be your only space that's required. Everywhere else, if you want to put a space, you can typically put spaces. You can put a space in here or around the comma or around the uh, parentheses. But I'll write this up on the, on the computer in a second just to give you a sense. What this is, is when you create a new ship, you can pass it in like the maximum speed and say like, okay, this ship can only go 10 knots, this ship can go 20 knots. So you can say, uh, we'll say coastal surveyor, and that would be a ship, and we'll pass it in. So this init call is the beginning call that goes with when you just call the name, ship, our max speed will give it 10 knot. And then we could say Kochiko ship that can go 20 knots. Or we'll make it really fast. The Kochiko can go 40 knots really fast. With these kinds of things, then you have these two objects around that you can then work with. And you can, you can create functions. So in here, first we can say self. So this refers to the object itself dot and then some parameter we want to save. So max speed equals max speed. So we've saved that value for later. So we can always use it. And then you can have functions that are attached to this class. And when you use those functions, they always know about themselves. So if you call a function inside of a class, it knows about that particular ship. So if we want to say def 
drive and you're going to give it like your x and y endpoint. This function in here, it gets to actually bring along self, and so it knows about itself, and then it can go ahead and figure out how to drive itself to, you know, the place you're asking it to go to. And it knows how fast it can go and how long it'll take to get there and things like that. This class idea is a wrapper for things where you can have the data and the functions and methods it's going to do to itself along with it for the ride. And by doing that, you can hide everything behind this thing. So you can say, dear ship, please go to point X, Y. Okay, you take care of it. I don't want to know about it. And that hiding of stuff lets you build big programs where you don't have to know all the details that you're, what you're looking at. So if you have a class ship that you've built up over time, you can ask it to do all these things and you don't have to remember how it does it. So every time you say go drive to point X, Y, you don't have to remember how to do that with a ship. It just will take care of itself now that you've programmed that in. So classes, we're going to see those a bunch. You've already used them. The file object that we played with is a class. So you open up a file and that file knew, okay, when you asked it for the next read line, it returned you a line. Well, that magic that happened was it kept track of where in the file it was. It grabbed some more data for you and gave it back. And it knows all sorts of things about itself, where it is in the file. It can jump around and do lots of things. And you don't have to know how do you actually work with a file because that's a little bit complicated. So we use that class to not have to worry about how do I go in and you know, count to the next new line in the file to try and find a, a line of data back for you. All that stuff is wrapped up in the class and it hides it. You've been using these things already without knowing it and they just make life look a lot simpler. So we're going to build a few of these throughout the class, well, throughout the lectures, shall we say, rather than the class. Now, this is one of those times I recommend going back and looking at the video and you'll see me go through classes there too. I'll do it a couple times throughout multiple videos. We'll build some classes for different things and we'll build some functions that stand on their own. And hopefully you'll start to see the difference between the two. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file called circle.py and we'll build a class that represents a circle. So I'm going to go ahead and say class circle. So class says we're beginning a class here. Then it's a type object. We're just going to take that at face value and not worry about what it means. And we need to be able to create a circle. So what do you think a circle might need to know for information about itself? Radius. We got a radius. Okay. So we'll say def init. So the two underscores look a little weird on the screen. You can't see with the font here if the, there's two underscores together. It can be a little hard to see. And then each function inside of a class, the first parameter is always going to be itself. So the, it basically gets passed in a pointer to itself where it contains its own data. And we can say radius. So we've just created a function like we did before, but it's inside of this class thing. We can then take that radius and we can say self dot radius. So that's inside of self. We're going to have a variable called radius and we're going to assign it the value of radius. Now that's a little confusing. So I'm going to change that name so that we, this is legal code, but I'm going to rewrite it a little bit. So it might be a little bit more obvious what's going on. A radius and a radius. So this way you can tell that this name coming in here as an argument is getting used here and being set into the radius. We can already use this thing that we've got and we can say my circle equals circle and then you have to give it the radius. So we'll give it a radius of 23.234 and now we actually can say print my circle dot radius and we should be able to run this. So we're going to create a circle object of a particular radius and here we're going to print out the radius of that circle. So let's go ahead and try and run that. So run circle. Assuming you haven't made any typographic errors, you should see 23.34 come back. So one of the things that we'd like to have with a circle and maybe be able to ask it its area. So we can create a function that for any particular circle can return us the area. Normally, you'd expect your area function for a circle to, have to take the radius, but with a class, the data 
the radius is already stored in the object, so it's got it inside itself. And so now we can calculate the area, and if I remember my equation for radius, it's uh, so radius or an area, so area equals 2 pi r squared. So this is a comment, so I'm not using the caret, but those of you might recognize that as a power. So we can say return 2 times math dot pi times radius times radius, so radius squared. And we can change our print to say has area of, and then we can say my circle dot area, and call that. So we've already built something where we've got some geometry and it's already knowing some things about itself. You can ask a circle what's its area. And does anybody see something wrong with what I've got up there? It's definitely not going to work. Ben? Yeah, you haven't imported math. Oh, I haven't imported math, yes. So if you use a module and you haven't imported, uh, you'll get, so if we do run, if I save this, circle, it's going to fail on the math.py here, this little arrow that's pointing at math.py. We have to do an import. The trouble is, if you've imported math over here on the left in your IPython, it's not available inside of that file. So every file has to do its own imports. Yep. Does it know what R and R is? Or it says nope. That would be our next bug. That's a great question. So if we want to say R equals self dot radius, then we might have a chance of this working. So a lot of times you'll find people, you write the code, you just go for it, and you can ask Python to keep trying to run until it succeeds. And that's an easy way to not, not put as much of the load on your brain in terms of trying to figure out all the syntax as you get comfortable with the error messages. Is you just let Python keep telling you, hey, you didn't, you didn't tell me the radius. What am I supposed to do with this? So if we save this one and we type run, circle, it now has a very big area. Self dot area. You could do self dot area inside of this, but you can't do self dot area outside. So self is something that only exists inside of a class. When you're in a, a method of a class, self comes in as a parameter. So Python passes it in the self variable already set up for you. In the test function. Yes, up here. Why don't you use the same sound? Area. Oh, why are we not saving it? Yes, you could you could calculate the area right here. You could say self self dot area. I'm gonna put a comment here so we don't get in trouble. Equals and then calculate it right here. And it's done once. But you you may never ask the circle for an area. Uh, in the second function we use return. Why don't you use the same like in the first one? Self dot area equal to you want to do self.area equals. If you want it to come back and be able to use it, so you need to get outside of here, you have to, you're calling a, a function, so you need to return the value back from the function. If I said self.area in here, it's only going to stay inside the class. So I can't get the value back out. And if I use the word area, it would also be colliding with something else called area. You can only have one thing called any particular name attached to a class. I don't expect you guys to be able to write a class at the end of today. Don't, don't worry about that. We're going to write a couple as we go throughout the class as we work with data types. And you're going to see them a few times. If you get through two or three of these and you're still not understanding it, then ask me a ton of questions and see if we can figure it out. But at this point, I wanted you to see the syntax to see us creating a little circle class. And then down the road, we'll go through it again and explain it a couple more times. And that repetition, you should start seeing the patterns a little bit more for these things. And you'll be using classes all the time, so you'll start seeing them as you go. Um, mine is saying that my circle is not defined. So if you look up here, did you have something like this line right here in your? OK, when you're looking at code, this is one of those things where attention to detail and typing
can, even if you're good at it, you're going to miss some stuff. So you got to use those eyeballs to try and find what you might have done wrong. If you've got troubles with this, see how I said my underscore circle? An easy thing to have disappear is an underscore. So you might say my circle and leave out the underscore. So. Things like that, those little, all those little punctuation, you have to be very accurate on your punctuation. This is the same in pretty much every programming language that attention to those little details. If you change a capitalization on a letter someplace, if you, uh, a classic one is you're coding at home, uh, you know, working late at night trying to get an assignment done, and your cat walks across the keyboard, you're going to have a very bad day as you try to find all the little things that your cat changed in your code. Really, when you, when you see bugs, read through really carefully. And a good trick for dealing with code is read it out loud and say, print my underscore circle dot radius and read it out loud. And oftentimes, you actually reading it out loud, saying it to yourself, you'll hear the mistake coming through your own voice use those kinds of things or have someone else read it to you really quick if you're really stuck. Especially if you're here late at night and you've got a buddy, use IRC, paste it to the other person and say, look at this line, do you see a punctuation problem? Because they happen to all of us. No matter how hard you try, you're gonna hit them and they can be really sneaky. And it's easier to find a bug in someone else's code than your own code, even if with the same error. Just because it's not something that you've written, you'll read it differently. I think it's time that we deal with some real data because I'm really, let's go look at some real data. Playing with fake data gets boring pretty quickly because we're not doing anything real. Let's go ahead in the 15 minutes we have left here and start collecting some data. So go ahead and quit out of IPython. Uh, just type exit or you can type control D or quit or capital exit. There's too many ways to do this. If you type the word type and SOCAT, this is the program that I showed you many lectures ago that gets, reaches out over the network and can grab data from services. And we're gonna go grab data from the uh, rooftop GPS weather station. And a couple of us around Seacom have been playing with this data set. It's, it's fun, it's always live. So whenever you look at it, it's always different. And we're not totally sure if the sensor is quite right or not. We have some questions, but those are kinds of things that we can figure out. SoCat isn't installed. Does anybody remember how to install a program like SoCat on Linux? If you try to run a program, Linux says, I think I know what program you, you wanted. It's not installed. I can give you a little hint. Here's how you might install it. So let's do sudo apt get install SOCAT, and then we'll type in our research tools password. It's exclamation point RT2011VM. And this is the wonderful thing about Linux. If the software is available, it's usually really easy to install. We haven't had to go running around the internet trying to find some sketchy software. And we now can say type SOCAT, and we can which is basically asking where in our path is this program. And it tells us SOCAT is user bin SOCAT. If you like lots of pain, you can read the whole man page, man SOCAT. What does it mean? Because it's hashed. Does that mean we already have it? Hashed, yes, it means it's indexed and already been found. So it's possible my system, I deleted it while I was prepping for a class, thinking that it would be cool to show you guys. So you may have already had it installed. So let's go learn the commands to dump some data. So SOCAT, TCP4, this is an internet protocol, transmission control protocol version four. This is sort of the backbone of the internet. If you uh, get a web page, you're using this probably more detail than you ever wanted to know. And then we'll say the host name, so data logger onecomnh This is a computer sitting upstairs in the server room. So if you're outside of CCOM, you can't see this one. And then after that comes the port number. So on every computer, there's up to 60,000 ports. And each one of those can have a separate uh, connection of data going back and forth. And then a minus sign. The minus sign is a special meaning to SOCAT saying, dump it to the screen. So just print it out. If you're brave, hit enter. We'll see if this thing crashes or not. 
I see lots of data streaming by. And you can hit Control C when you're done. So there's the command again to run it. Now, do any of you remember how to only get a few lines back from a program in Bash, since we're in the Bash shell? Head, excellent. So let's go ahead and do uh, vertical bar and head. So there we've gotten 10 lines back from our server. I'll give you a quick tour of some of these parameters, the ones I can remember off the top of my head. ZDA, S string, this is, this is all <coughs> NEMA strings. The first two letters are the talker, it's who's speaking, and this means GP means the GPS. And ZDA is the type of message it's sending us, and I know that that's a time string. So in here, this should be some sort of date and time, so I see a 2011. MWD is some sort of weather sensor report, and WI, I think, is some sort of weather sensor. Looks like we have some temperatures or pressures or something in here. Uh, GGA, you're going to see that one a lot, especially if you're out surveying. This is a GPS position. It's not quite latitude and longitude. It's not as easy as we would hope. It would have been nice if they just had, like, you know, your latitude and longitude written out, but we don't get to be that easy. And I think MDA is also another weather sensor, so we have two weather ones here. And these will just keep coming at you as long as you're willing to listen. So let's save a bunch of that data to the disk. Does anybody remember how to send data from that's coming out of a program into a file in Bash? Greater than symbol. Awesome, I heard it, a greater than symbol. Pipe it to head, but we're going to give it a thousand lines. We're, we want some a good bit of data here. Then do a greater than symbol, and then call it ccom weather.log. Hit enter. It looks like nothing's happening. But what we can do is we can open up another terminal and cd into class 13, do an ls l. Here we've got our ccom weather log. I'll show you guys a fun command to know in Unix. If you do a tail to give you the last, but you give it dash f, it will always watch the end of the file. And every time new stuff is written in that file, it'll print it to the screen. So tail minus f and then the file name. And you can watch the data coming in and getting logged to disk. So the command was tail minus f and then the file name. So you did a dash and then see how you meant to do 1,000? You did one and then three oh. dashes. <laughs> you probably want to hit problem. the up arrow and change that to 1,000 <laughs> and that'll help out. So you guys are now official data loggers. So I'll walk through that again since this is a little bit complicated. SoCat is our network dumper program that will listen for data someplace and then pass it on somewhere else. TCP4, this is an address protocol where you have to have an endpoint that you're talking to. Hopefully we'll go through a few more of those and that will start making some sense. Definitely ask questions as we go through this more times because TCP and UDP are a little hard to explain if you haven't seen them before. Data logger one is .ccom.nh is the host that we're talking to. And then it has a series of ports on it. And I know because I set it up that port 36,000 has got the weather data coming out it. Dash puts it out to the, the, uh, the screen. The vertical bar captures that output to the screen. We want head to grab the first batch of lines. You guys remember from that homework assignment that you can tell it how many lines you want to grab? So a thousand lines. The greater than sends it to a file. And then we're going to pass it out to that log file. And you're going to save a thousand lines of weather data to a log file. On Tuesday, we're going to start parsing weather data. And I hope that we start plotting data up both in matplotlib and maybe working with a GIS program called GIS to, to plot that up. And we can even take a look at like how well the GPS is doing. You can see it wander a little bit. I haven't tried that on this one. I'm thinking it's probably got enough water that we can see it in a nice little plot. That's it for today. Please do watch the videos. I'm going to go back through this stuff in the videos. Some of them have already been made. I'll do a couple more. And I'm going to talk about creating functions and classes. We'll keep talking about it for the next couple weeks. But it takes a little while and a lot of work to really get the hang of functions and classes and assigning variables.
So I see data coming out here. Is this your I tail? Because I restarted it again. Mm -hmm. So a broken pipe means that it finished. The head said, OK, I'm cutting off your, your flow of data. And SoCat said, oh my god, I don't like that, and just quit, which is what you wanted it to do. But so my question is, when I restarted it, am I overwriting that file? Since you're using the greater than, that's overwrite. If you use two greater thans together, it's a pen too. Yep.